Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode on the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today we have Vivian Wang. Vivian, welcome to the podcast. Awesome to be here, Ryan. Of course. Vivian, tell us more about yourself and your upbringing. Absolutely. Um, a little bit on me. Uh, I grew up in central Ohio in this small suburb called Dublin. Actually, my first foray into everything that Landed does was being a barista at a local coffee shop called Caribou Coffee. I just really wanted those like free caramel macchiatos. So <laughs> ended up getting a job there. And then I went to Princeton, studied public policy, had my career start in finance. Most recently, I was over at Gap Inc. advising the C-suite there on various strategic initiatives, a really big one being hiring or course development and did Y Combinator and founded Landed. And I can talk a bit more about Landed, but that's a little bit on me. Of course, that is really unique background. So for reference, is Dublin near Columbus, Ohio? Yes, that's right. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really fun area, but for obviously people's perspective, I would imagine that the Asian demographic there is very limited. <laughs> Yeah, it is. And actually, it was interesting, right? Because my parents immigrated from China. And when they came to the US, their first jobs, well, they came for their education. But their first jobs were being a dishwasher and a waitress at a local Chinese restaurant. And now they, they moved around a little bit, but we stayed generally in central Ohio. And 20 years later, they're both now software engineers with two kids in Princeton. My sister is actually graduating next week. Oh, okay. wow. They must, oh, wow. That's, that's a big turnaround and congratulations to them. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think really like through my parents' experience, I learned that a lot about like the blue collar workforce, like ultimately that is a huge part of the mission of what we're doing at Landed. And I can talk about that in a little bit, but I, really came to understand that blue collar workers, hourly workers, they want to have a career, they want to move up the ladder in life. So that really kind of helped shape the type of business that I was wanting to build. Wow. And describe your experience, like through your parents' experience working at restaurants, right? Were you one of those, you know, immigrant kids that sat at the restaurant and kind of watched their parents work and in the corner? Like, what was that experience like for you? Well, I was a newborn at the time, so I, uh, I hear all the stories secondhand from them. I got, both of them, I would say, are a lot more talented in front of the computer than they necessarily were in that context. But I think really it made me think about a lot of things, right? Because when I was at Princeton, I was studying a lot of economic policy. And I watched the gig economy, which was characterized at the time by companies like Uber, Instacart, Lyft, all these companies commoditizing labor in a way. But I think that that's kind of short-sighted when it came to giving blue collar workers the opportunity to upskill it. So that's really kind of what, what we've decided to build here, but a lot of it kind of shaped on seeing my parents' lived experience, studying it from more of an academic perspective at Princeton, and then seeing it kind of in the professional sphere when I was at Gap Inc. Oh, wow. That's awesome to hear, right? And, and I think companies are built on a very strong why tends to be the one that can weather all the storms. Because entrepreneurship is very tough, right? And kind of curious too, like, how, how did you even like, put together this idea and action together is that make something happen, right? To build this company. Was this something that you always thought about? Was it that was like, was it your environment that you're in that fostered the entrepreneurship? Like how did you develop your entrepreneur mindset? Yeah, sure. So I'll back up a little bit and kind of talk about what we're building and then how we got there. So we're building at Landed a livelihood platform. So a livelihood platform, it's basically this thinking through an economic model that gives workers control over their jobs, their finances, and their education by offering tailored peer-to-peer -peer and uh, B2C advice and opportunities. So today we're working with companies like Blaze Pizza, Panera, 
all the way up to Jose Andres' Sing Food, Food Group, the Ritz Carlton. We're helping all these awesome brands hire. And I guess like the way that this journey happened was um, when I ultimately, you know, we launched March of 2020, right? So March of 2020 was a really interesting time uh, because it was a difficult year for job seekers across the U.S. We literally launched March 14th and I was living in San Francisco at the time and the entire city shut down like two to three days later. And for me, that was all those alarming news stories that were circulating online about the havoc the pandemic would wreak became vividly real that second week of March because overnight we saw job seekers pouring into our newly launched job candidate like platform by the thousand. Like we did no advertising, no marketing. Job seekers were just finding us. And that really made our work extremely urgent. And we decided to start directing all of our energy into building the fastest way for furloughed or laid off hourly workers to land on their feet with a new job. So now that the US is reopening, we are facing a 9 million person staffing deficit across food, retail, hospitality. And we've helped a bunch of companies ranging from mom and pop shops, keep their doors open all the way up to these large multi-unit franchise holding groups. And the goal is to help them adapt to that new landscape. So really like the way that we got started was we had this idea and it just became so necessary because essential workers were using us to support their livelihoods. And then it evolved a little bit because all these stores, in order to keep open, they need to use Landed in order to run their businesses. So we have two customers here and uh, both of them have been through quite a roller coaster in the past two to three years. Oh, oh, wow. I mean, thank you so much for creating a platform for these business owners to use, right? And I, I mean, obviously, every bad situation, there's always an upside to it. And obviously, um, you know, fortunately, you were also there to sort of like help people who are in need. So out of curiosity, like, what, how has the team dynamics changed during the pandemic? And like, how have you like evolved yourself and the company to like deal with the company post pandemic, right? Because we see situations like DocuSign or other companies that grew tremendously during the pandemic, but now they're, even Peloton's a great example, right? <laughs> you know, and that, you know, at post pandemic, now they're dealing with people who are leaving the platform. How have you been able to shift your, your, your team and your culture and your mission to like post pandemic life? Yeah, absolutely. So the pandemic has done a lot for the industry and when we think about like at Landed, we have three main values and five operating principles that really tell us how we need to be running the business, regardless of if there is or is not the pandemic. So the three values are customer obsession. The second is ownership and humility. The third is embrace the impossible. So when we were seeing these thousands of job seekers pour into our platform overnight. Well, we rolled up our sleeves and we we're like, now it's time to go and find our partners on the other side of this marketplace to get them these jobs. And at the time it felt impossible. And now needing to staff a 9 million person staffing deficit also feels impossible, but we're there landing tens of thousands of people's jobs. We're helping over 300 businesses stay open. So those are our three values. And I think the way that we have, that we operate has stayed consistent from our founding to now. So operating principles are more like the how, like every day-to-day, -day, how do we actually make hard decisions? It's great when the hard decisions are between a good decision and a great decision. And it's, that's not always the case. It's more like we have limited time. We need to do something quickly. We need to get something to market. So what is the best out of two, you know, not optimal decisions. You're, you're just trying to move as quickly as you can. And the first uh, operating principle is uh, move with urgency and focus because candidates are relying on us to support their livelihoods. These employers are relying on us to keep their doors open. So we got to just move quickly. 
and efficiently. The second one is macro optimism, micro pessimism, which means that on the macro scale, we are really dedicated to our mission, but on the micro scale, we need to make sure we're thinking rigorously about everything. Third is take smart leaps, not baby steps. Fourth is results reign supreme. And fifth is frugality. And these are all just like super important. I think some of them are kind of informed by my Asian upbringing, but ultimately I believe everything can be achieved with less resources and less time and less money. And that's how we're able to run very efficiently. I think those are really good, good core values to have, right? And it's almost refreshing because I feel like oftentimes most startups sort of overlook their core values. Like we got to build fast. We got to move fast. You got to hire fast. But you don't have the system and structure in place. Like you're going to feel the pain a couple of years later, right? As you continue to grow. Yeah. Because people who are entering to your company um, from a later stage to the point where you don't even know anyone's names and faces anymore, that's when like your core values will like definitely play into hand, right? Yeah, and like, and so someone told me early on when I started this, when I founded Landed that when you feel, when you know things are going well, you, it's, that's the feeling of you're just literally trying to hang on. You're trying to run as quickly as you can to keep up. Like you're not going to feel like you have anything under control. You're just going to feel like the demand of the market or the product is just like pulling you forward. And you're just like, you know, kind of grabbing onto the back of this, like of this car. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I th think like, you know, what I found, we 18 X last year was just really exciting um, from business growth. And they made this analogy of like Legos. So you really have to, you have a set of Legos and it's a limited set of Legos. You have limited team that's able to help you build, you know, build things with these Legos. And over time you have to give them away. And I think that's been a challenging part because every founder wants to control every single aspect of their business to perfection. And that is just simply not as possible, right? So as you're growing the team, you have to give away Legos. You're going to have to teach people on your team to give away Legos too, because the natural instinct is to want to control everything because you, then you, well, you presumably know the outcome, but as soon as you start giving that away, you need to build that trust with people on your team and let them build what they need to build and then let them you know, manage their team to build what they need to build. So if in a startup that is super high growth, you're going to feel like your job is changing literally every month. Every month you're giving away new Legos, you're getting new Legos. So I think, but I think that's like the exciting thing. That's why people love joining startups because there's like unlimited new problems to, uh, to face. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the most rewarding and exciting things about being an entrepreneur is like your fast paced environment, not really knowing what you're doing. <laughs> it's half the time, you're just praying that you're going in the right direction. But your answer is so far, it's like very textbook, startup, culture, everything I read in these, these books, like mm -hmm. everything you implemented, company values, scaling, delegations. I think you're doing everything right. And that's, that's really awesome to hear, right? And I want to shift the focus back on yourself and kind of hear about like, what is it like being like, like an Asian American woman founder in the tech space? Because we read a lot of articles and, and see a lot on the Asian House Network about underrepresentation, not seeing enough uh, C-levels, not, not seeing enough Asian American women founders. What has been your experience like being in San Francisco, fundraising, building a team? And we know that the venture world could you use a little bit more diversity in there? <laughs> you know? But I just want to hear from your experience what that has been like. Yeah, I learned, I'd say like two main lessons about the fundraising experience. And, uh, you know, I always like to think about, like I think of myself as a founder, right? And I love seeing other Asian Americans and other women in the space, but I want us all to, kind of be thought of like all on equal playing field. And so like the way to, I think that people need to approach like fundraising and building teams is specifically on the fundraising side. I learned to, I learned, you know, a lot of lessons um, from fundraising. Now we've raised like $8.5 million. 
um, it is recently a 7 million seed. So it's been really exciting, but I made a ton of mistakes along the way. And a big takeaway is that when you're fundraising, it's a conversation, it's not an interrogation. You need to be having a conversation with investors. You should be asking them the same, if not more questions than they're asking you, especially if you're getting to know them in those initial coffee chats. I feel like a lot of founders just, they think of fundraising as such a monolithic task, but really all fundraising is, is finding people that you're gonna bring onto your team and you are gonna have them on your team forever. So um, I think the second lesson is, you need to think about the roadmap of where your company is going. So you'll break it out. You know, you might not have like a 10 year plan, but you probably have the, you know, the next six to 12 months in sight of what you're looking to build. In the early days, all of our product sprints were like two week product sprints. Like that's how quickly we were moving. And when you think about the roadmap of where your company is going, it's not just product. It's also your go to market. It's your hiring. It's your uh, sales, marketing, everything. So you need to stack your bench with investors who are actually going to be able to help you in those areas on your roadmap. So if you're thinking about if you have product market fit, if you're trying to scale a sales team, if you're developing pricing models, if you're looking to get business development intros because you have a laundry list of these companies you want to become your customers, figure out what that roadmap is, prioritize them, and then go and find the investors that are going to help you check those boxes because, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just wanted you to say that again, right? Because I feel like when people look for investors nowadays, they kind of just like, whoever's going to give me the most money first, you're in, <laughs> you know, or give me the most yeah. money, you're in. But I just want you to say that again, because like, that's true, right? When you're finding investors, it's not just their money that's going to obviously help the company grow. It's their insight, experience, and knowledge that's both like, sustain you for a little bit, right? Because as a first-time founder or a second-time founder, you're always going to run into things that you don't know, right? Yeah. And you're going to have to rely on your bench. And most, more, more formal term for your bench is your future board, right? <laughs> Sorry, exactly. go ahead. Yeah, and um, yeah, to, to your point, just kind of reiterating that, right? You Money is just as green as any other money. If you have investors who are going to give you money. They're going to be other investors. There's so much money out there. So if you're looking to raise money, make sure that money is actually going to help you more than just money. Because ultimately, if you're thinking about scaling, like for example, uh, scaling a sales team, you're also looking to potentially make your first like you know head of sales higher. So make sure that the investor understands like the stage of your company. Because when, for example, and it, flip, the flip side of that is hiring. When you're hiring on leaders to your team, make sure that they know how to grow that size company. The number one thing I that disqualifies somebody from becoming head of anything at Landed is when someone asks, well, what will my team look like as soon as I join? And I'm like, well, there's currently no team. You're going to be the first person to do this. And you're going to, I'm looking for you to tell me what type of team you need to hit our OKRs, to hit our objectives and key results. I have these goals and I'm looking for leaders on the team to help us get there. So similarly, when you're talking to investors, like you, you don't need to figure, you don't need an expert on how to go take your company public. That's for later. Look for the investors who are gonna be able to help you hire that head of sales to help you um, develop your initial go-to-market strategy and look at their portfolio companies because the best, and go and reach out to those founders and their portfolio companies. They should help make intros and ask them what it's been like to work with them. It's, it's very similar to like a job interview and rather than you being the one who's being interrogated, think of yourself as the one who's interrogating them. Because you have limited spots on your bench. You have to make sure that they're filled with people who can compliment you. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that statement a lot. And 
yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, right? You want people that can help you and fill out your bench and give you knowledge and everything. Um, and also, like, one more thing, too, like, your cap space is kind of limited, right? Because in every round, you don't want to give up a bolt, bolt ton of, like, bolt ton <laughs> of equity <laughs> yeah. to, to people, right? And they also have, they have to pull their weight and pull their value. So and that's, re- that's a really, really good tip. And I can't help but, but realize, like, your company, you started this in March 2020 right and the answers you gave it's like really really good so I'm kind of curious like how did you become the person you are today right was it did you like do like mentorship programs at Princeton did you do other companies before you started landed um because this, these are really really good answers I'm just really really curious about like how did you became the person you are today Yeah, I think that one of the things that was so helpful at the beginning of my journey was joining Y Combinator. Y Combinator is this accelerator program for a bunch of early stage companies to basically get together and um, build their companies in parallel. And then it all culminates with this thing called Demo Day, where you present your company and all your awesome growth, hopefully, um, in front of a bunch of venture capital firms. So I think that what YC taught really well was, and this is a tip for any like, new founders out there, and something that I had to kind of adapt to because I had worked at in finance, I had worked at large 10,000, like 10,000 plus person companies at Gap Inc. I joined really early at this um, at Matterport, which is a virtual home tour company, starting the business operations team there and seeing it you know, last year go public, which was super exciting, but I've been in all these different uh, worlds. And I think it's really easy to think that the playbook for a large company is the same as the playbook for like literally a one person, three person company. And what YC taught like really well was thinking about your metrics and keeping yourself really honest to your metrics, because then everything else flows from that. And, um, and So a helpful tip for founders, hopefully, is like really single in on the most important metric you're trying to drive. There really should only be one. And that one probably should be revenue. (laughs) Um, You know, maybe user growth, but revenue tends to be the most important one. Remove all the other noise. Most of the stuff really doesn't matter until much later than you think. Um, The one that I was kind of stuck on at the beginning was brand. I was like, well, you know, if we're consumer facing in any way, then we need to make sure that we have really great brand presence. We have, we built community and there are all these things that come along with that. But then when I was in YC, the, the answer was don't worry about any of that stuff. You don't have bandwidth to worry about any of that stuff. You literally are one person. So go and focus on revenue and do what do unscalable things to get to the revenue number because that's going to force you to learn and all those other secondary metrics are going to follow from the primary one. So I have a fun example of this. Um, This is like so uh, it was it was kind of like anti everything I had learned at Gap Inc which is so focused on brand and consumer experience but our first website was something that our very talented intern, Audrey, put together in one day using various free design tools. <laughs> like I think Canva, Figma, Clipart, Google, just a bunch of random stuff put on a website. And um, and when I first looked at it, I was like, wow, this is nice, but it's not like, you know, it's not like professionally designed, but that remained our website for a whole year and it did its job. That was the year we 18 x in revenue. And so I think a lot of it was me throwing away and just simply ignoring some of those best practices I best practices that I learned in different settings and really adapting and holding myself responsible to those metrics. And of course I have an amazing network from YC with other founders. Whenever I have any questions, I just like ping them. I'm like, hey, like, how do you think about this? What did you do here? And having other um, folks and other companies that are going through the exact same challenges on the same time frame as you are is so helpful because then you can learn from other people's mistakes uh, and 
kind of connecting with other people who are a couple of cohorts ahead of you, they're a year or two ahead of you. So they probably have made several of the mistakes you're about to, and you can just learn from those and avoid them. So it's been really just a culmination of that community, a lot of that great training that they gave us and basically cutting the BS, focusing on things that are hard to focus on because they're not vanity metrics. It's cold, hard you know, numbers. And then, um, and then also an amazing team. Like my team is great. That's how I'm able to be a solo founder is because I have such an amazing team that just is really invested in the mission and uh, helping grow landed. Yeah. And being a solo founder speaks volume to your character because it's very, very hard as a solo founder, right? I think statistically solo, solo founders, like, um, don't do so hot after a couple of years, but I think that you're a rising star, right? And regarding your website earlier too, it just reminds me like the MVP model, right? Where it's like yeah. minimum viable product and it, it works, it works, but I'm pretty sure like, you know, your website is fully revamped now and I love it. It's, you're, you're putting everything you said so far regarding like culture, building your company, finding mentors, finding a board, building out your products, very like spot, fundamentally spot on. So I'm super excited about like the future of landed, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we're super pumped. I mean, uh, and we're hiring too. So if, if anyone who's listening to this is looking to break their way into startup world, if you're excited about what we're doing, like definitely shoot me a DM. Definitely. Uh, we'll make sure we include that in the show notes. Um, but then probably one of the last two questions I wanna ask is a, a personal question, right? And I, we know for a fact that the startup world is quite brutal can you can you talk about like your moments of doubt where you kind of doubted your decision or you felt you're extremely lonely or how, how did you like can you talk through like those experiences and like how'd you overcome them yeah absolutely I think that those moments of doubt and like vulnerability if you're in the if you're if you founded your company for the wrong reasons you're probably it's gonna be really hard to get through those moments because uh, if it's money oriented, you can make more money by not being a founder, probably. <laughs> you know, you can get, and you can probably have a much cushier life uh, with a lot less work. So that's, so kind of going back to your first principles, like why did you actually found the company? Make sure that it's a good reason um, and that your life, like livelihood can actually withstand it. Uh, like, you know, your way of life, you know, however you want to live your life. And so I think that um, in those moments of vulnerability uh, and doubt, I kind of came back to, well, first, like super supportive, like network. So talking to people, it's just like talk about it with other people. Everybody has gone through it. And, um, and something I like to use is this like prioritization framework for myself. So similar to like how you would be prioritizing things in your business, I prioritize things like in my, in my life. And so like, for example, there's like this idea that you have to be a truly like hardcore founder. A lot of the vulnerability and self-doubt comes from looking outward and seeing what, uh, you know, a paragon of a perfect founder looks like, but in reality, like there's not one type of perfect founder and there is absolutely no perfect founder. Everyone has a unique story and path to getting where they are. And so um, if you look at, you're like, okay, well, I'm not hardcore enough because I'm not eating 99 cent ramen for five years in a row in my basement. Like it, you can kind of feel bad about yourself. You're like, well, maybe I'm not hardcore enough, but you know, you have to ignore those types of like, I think visuals that are propagated by social media. And it's really imperative to go back to um, those strong, like the mission that you have for your business. And you have to think back before you start your company and throughout in those, uh, in those moments, document like how the existence of your company will make the world markedly different in 10 years. Uh, so at the beginning, I thought, okay, with us, every single blue collar worker, there are 90 million of them in the US, there are 2.7 billion worldwide. Every worker is going to be able to come onto Landed and know that 
every aspect of their life will be taken care of. There's somebody watching out for them, like a security net for their livelihood. And that is something that doesn't exist today. And the fact that landed exists will mean that that can happen. So when I have those moments, you can go back to that picture that you painted. I'm a very visual person and I imagine that picture and it keeps me focused and it keeps me moving with urgency because I'm like, okay, well, my problems are not as big as this problem that I'm envisioning. So um, I need to work through these so I can quickly get back to the task at hand, which is making this picture I painted for myself and for the team and, you know, the investors that we brought on who believe in this mission, um, we, we need to like go after that, go back after that. So yeah, combination of like prioritizing you and also painting that picture and making sure that picture is something that you're still invested in. You might not be still invested in it, in which case that's totally fine. Pivot, like we've pivoted um, in the past. And, uh, but in that moment, you need to kind of like reflect on that and, you know, modify it to fit something that you can be excited about. And that's going to pull you out of those moments. I love it. It's so organized. Like <laughs> as you're talking, I can kind of visualize what you see and do. Uh, so I'm really excited for what's next for you. Right. And I'm really excited for what you are building and continue to build with great passion and uh, congratulations, on everything. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's super exciting. And I love what you guys are doing also in supporting the Asian community. I think there need to be more Asian founders and, um, and we need to like support each other to, of course. to yeah. talk about those moments that you just mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So we have one more final question, Vivian. And that question is, if you can give one advice to aspiring Asian, Asian American women founder, what advice would that be? Yeah, I think my one piece of advice would be before you jump into anything, sit down and make sure that what you're about to jump into is something that you're that you are so passionate about that you want to spend the next like five to 10 years working on that thing. And then decide it's like those are the that's the value point. And then go to your operating principles of what is the environment that you need in order to help you be the most successful there. So is it that you can only quit your job once you have funding? Maybe that's your risk to appetite. Maybe your risk appetite is more and you're willing to just like jump into it and figure things out because you have a, you know, a different like life, you're okay with a different lifestyle. Whatever it may be, just figure out that prioritization in your life. Um, and if you have a co-founder, figure out their prioritization. Does family, do friends come before the company or does the company come before family and friends? It's just, everybody has a different answer to that. So just make sure that you're, you're okay with their answer and that they align. And then um, make sure that you have that really strong picture of where you're trying to be and where you're trying to take the world a decade from now. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fantastic answer. <laughs> um, Vivian, how can our listeners find out more about you and uh, contact you online? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Twitter um, and I can share my Twitter there, but you can just search up Vivian Wang on Twitter, uh, landed and I should pop up. And you can also find me on LinkedIn and definitely DM me if you're working on any cool things and restaurant, hospitality, marketplaces, I would love to chat. And also we are hiring across every, uh, across all of the different roles. So please reach out to me there too. Awesome. Vivian, thank you so much for coming to the podcast today. Thank you so much, Brian, for having me. Of course. Well, can't wait to keep up with your successes and maybe have you come back and show us sometime in the future. Sounds good. Thank right. you. Thank you.